good afternoon and welcome to the uh, May 2014 meeting of the uh, Board of uh, Directors of Social Services. I'd like to uh, have you all take a, a moment of, uh, for silent meditation or prayer. Usually at this time we give a uh, opportunity for the uh, public to address us. At this time, no one has um, decided to uh, come forth again. We really uh, would like the citizens of Fair County to take the opportunity to talk to uh, to us directly and to share their views and uh, concerns. Uh, before we go further, we'll get to it. As you can see, I'm jacketless and uh, t-shirted, uh, and we'll be talking a little about that. I know you're all concerned about why I'm not wearing a jacket today, so I wanted to let you all know about that at the beginning. Uh, I'd like to uh, see if there are any revisions to uh, today's agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move we adopt the uh, agenda today if there are no revisions. Okay, motion has been made and- uh, And I second it. Mm, motion has been made and uh, Second it to adopt today's agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the minutes that were mailed to us. There are no corrections. And I second that. Okay. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, again, I'd like to um, thank the um, um, the, the group that are responsible for the minutes, I really find them to be very good and very uh, thorough. Um, now we're going to move on down to uh, matters which require board action. Um, first we go to uh, PJ Quinn. Yes, sir. We received $374 uh, for our Duke Energy Energy Neighbor Fund that is used to uh, help eligible Pitt County citizens with a utility bill, and it comes from the state. There's no county dollars in it. Okay. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. To approve. Okay. Second the motion. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded to approve this, uh, uh, the, uh, the funds. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Um, let's see. First off, we're going to go to uh, reports um, to the board, and I'll be with uh, Susan Bullock, Ann Weaver, and Joy Boykin. Um, hello. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity. Um, if you haven't noticed, May is Foster Care Month, and in celebration of that, we've provided shirts to the board as well as to our foster parents and to the child welfare staff. In celebration of this, last Wednesday we had a walk, a community walk here at the county office building, and next Wednesday we'll be having another walk in which we have invited the board as well as foster parents and our child welfare staff and DSS and whole to participate. Um, we could not do this without our foster parents, without our social workers, without our guardian ad items, so I'm gonna refer to my coworker Joy Boykin to talk to you a little bit about the foster parents. We are fortunate that we have several of our foster parents present at our meeting today. We actually have 28 licensed homes, 43 individually licensed individuals who make up those 28 homes. 
And today I would like to um, pass out a certificate of appreciation for all their hard work. Some of our foster parents here have been foster parents for many years and some have just uh, completed their first year of fostering, but we appreciate what they do. Fostering is not for the faint of heart. It is a difficult job and we are continuously recruiting families that um, can assist our agency partner with us to meet the needs of the children in foster care. I'm gonna pass out some certificates. The certificate says certificate of appreciation in special appreciation for unselfish contribution to foster children. Pitt County Department of Social Service recognizes you as an outstanding member of our foster care family. I, I will Do just- Do you want uh, to let them come front and Dr. Hamilton help yeah, you? That, that would be wonderful, yes. Oh, okay. I get to show off my t-shirt. <laughs> Do it right up, right up here. Um, get it right up here. Right here. Right, right here. Right up here. Okay. So that would, that would in front of that camera can get you right up there. Okay. Willie and Dara Stanton. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your service. You took the Willie. There you go. Okay. Really appreciate that. That's so nice of you to take your time out to come here and to be with us and to work with the children. <laughs> <coughs> Michael and Karen Dingfelder. Thank you so much for taking time out and coming and being with us and for spending a lot of hours with the children. We appreciate that so much. Laverna Dixon. Okay, well, I guess we need to go over there. Yeah, I think we need to okay. go over there. Let's have the camera follow us. I guess the mouse came up. How are you? Thank you very much for taking time out to work with our children. We really appreciate it very much. Mr. Jeffrey Foreman. And his wife, Renee, was unable to come today, but I'm going to let you go ahead and okay. get both of those to I guess we can give it to him. He'll give I, it to I her. Think so. We're going to call <laughs> later on and make sure you did. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate that. Here you are. Hazel Griffin. Thank you very much, Ms. Griffin. Really appreciate your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Jones. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Here you are. Brenda and James Mercer. Thank you very much, Mark, for your service. And uh, see you back at the big house. <laughs> we kind of have an association. Miss Barbara Page. Thank you so much, Miss Page, for your Thank time you. and service. Thank you. Sydney Roach. Again, thank you all so much for your for your time and service. We really appreciate that, and we're glad you were able to come out. And again, thank you from all of us. And my name is Ann Weaver, and I would just like to thank the foster care staff of Pitt County, which most of them are in that back corner. A foster care is a very difficult and demanding job. These people work. It's not a 40-hour work-a-week job. They spend many hours at it. They sacrifice time with their own families to make sure the needs of the children in Pitt County are um, taken care of. And they might not, not always feel it, but they do have a great impact on the lives of children and families here in Pitt County. 
Glad I'm here. Appreciate that. Um, what we're going to do, um, because of your service, we're going to have a, uh, a, a reception, and we're going to have a, a maybe a 10-minute recess, okay. a 10-minute or 15-minute recess so that uh, you can um, come and have a little bit. And also, as I understand it, some of you have to get back to work, and I know that we don't want to put more stress on you than uh, you've uh, had already. Yeah? How many children do we have in foster care? Big County. Okay. Well, we're we're back after having a reception for our foster parents and our staff. Uh, again, uh, want to say how much we do appreciate their work and their um, effort. So we're going to continue now. You want to introduce I'd like, somebody? I'd like to thank the foster parents and um, our staff too. Um, we just can't realize the impact that these people make on children's lives that come to us after very horrifying experiences and damaging experiences. And they make a huge difference in, in people's lives. It's, it's difficult. They, it probably costs them more than they spend on fostering our children. And I, I just personally want to thank them because I, I, they, they do a wonderful, wonderful job. Mm -hmm. Also, like to welcome Miss Susan Moore, who's the director of social services from Lenore County, that's joining us today. Okay, been glad that you're here. Okay, we're going to go next to the in-home services uh, bid recommendation. That'll be by uh, Gwen Burns. Okay. Um, the um, upcoming 2014-2015 um, in-home bid contract this year. Four bids were submitted for consideration. Those bid packages for, were from Action Health Staffing, Addis Healthcare, Health Pro, McLeod Associ and Associates Incorporated. Um, we um, did on-site visits to all four companies, and all companies were found to have the basic structure in place in order to compete for the contract this year. Uh, although we feel that all four agencies can provide appropriate uh, care and services to the clients of Pitt County, um, after carefully considering, we recommend the 2014-2015 contract for in-home aid services be awarded to Addis Healthcare. Addis Healthcare is the current in-home provider uh, for Pitt County at this time. Um, we are making that recommendation uh, because we want to allow continu continuity of care for our clients, and this would allow our clients to have that continuity of care. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed and that I always uh, want to see is uh, after we um, do pay them and after we look at the rates and things of that nature, how have they performed in the past, and um, I was um, impressed with the fact that there were a series of client surveys that were done during November uh, 2013, again on March of uh, uh, 2014, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed like they were extremely favorable, as well as the fact that they did talk to clients as well as aid records, and also a nurse is available, which I think is also um, very important. So I was impressed more with the uh, services as well as their uh, ability to focus on the, the needs of the clients. And they are currently serving 54 clients at this time at the rate of $12.35 an hour. Okay. Anybody have any no. input? If you, we wanted to get the best for the people, especially, I mean, I know we're in competition with mm -hmm. the price and so forth. I've got no. Okay. All right, next we're going to go to. You want, motion. Sir, oh. you want a motion to support yeah, the staff's recommendation? Yeah, I think that would be good. I'd like to uh, have a motion. So moved. Second. And I okay. second it. Okay, motion has been uh, made and uh, seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. 
all done. Okay. Next, we're going to go to um, IMC profile. And that's um, Mary Paramore. From Pitt Community College. chance to chat with you about the work we've done. Um, we profile the job income at worker. Could you get a little closer to the mic? I can. Move okay, it. I can. okay. Is that helpful? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So we um, we profiled the job for incumbent caseworker. When we do a job profile, what we're looking at is what what is required in order for someone to be successful in doing the job. And we're looking at those foundational skills. The process is a work keys process by ACT. So it's the same people you're familiar with when you think about um, taking the ACT to see if you have the skills necessary to be successful at college. So it's the same company and what they've done is worked out a profile that looks at how we know if you are gonna be successful at work, if you have the foundational skills to be successful on the job. So when the nice part about that is by working through ACT, we already have someone who's done the validation test, which means does this thing measure what it says it's gonna measure? Um, you have to have two independent validations in order to be, a, be able to use this kind of a process in hiring or screening or any kind of high case, um, high profile kind of case where you're using it to say certain people might get the job or do well in the job and others won't. So it's been validated by more than one source. It also has the reliability testing done, which means if I take it today and I don't know anything else and six months from now I take it again, will I get the same results? And you will. So we have that part done. And the way the process then works, after we know those two pieces are in place, we have to make sure there's no adverse impact. So we rely on ACT to do those studies as well because they have the industrial organizational psychology people and the funds to make sure that happens. So that's why we choose that particular group to work with. A lot of the background work is done for us. Um, then the profile process looks like this. We take a particular job and we put together sort of a basic task list. It's, it's the part where the profiler gets a start. They job shadow somebody, they look at um, the all the all the data that comes with the job as far as the um, job descriptions, forms that might be used on the job, training that's involved with that job. You kind of pull all that together and you make what looks like a task list. And it's usually not perfect, but it gives people a place to start. And then you meet with subject matter experts. Those are incumbent workers, people who are doing the job right now. You need more than 10% of the population so that you have a good representation. They refine that task list so that you end up with a list of tasks that relate directly to that job. When we did it, um, Beaufort County was also looking at doing the same process. So we saved everybody some money and combined the Beaufort County profiler and their subject matter experts with ours because the job was the same job. So we were able to do that and use that one profile in both locations by having subject matter experts from both locations. So that, that worked out to be nice for everybody involved. Um, so once you put the task list together, then you ask those people, the subject matter experts who do the job, to look at a particular skill that you define very clearly for them and say, are the tasks in this job related to this skill? In other words, if I was going to do any of these tasks, would I use this particular skill? And they select those independently, and then we reach a consensus. Now, if we determine that that skill is required to do the job, so if it's required for one task and none of the other tasks, unless that task is really, really critical, you don't need to screen for that in hiring. But when you see it show up for 70% of the tasks, 40%, 80%, now you know we need to look at at what level does someone need to perform. So the subject matter experts who are in the process, they determine that level. So once we know this skill is required, then let's look at at what level. And those are very clearly defined by ACT to match their assessment piece. So we go through that process. That process was completed and has been logged in with ACT. So we have profiled that and we know what's needed in order to be successful in the job as far as foundational skills. The three skills that we looked at and, and that the SMEs determined needed to be successful in were applied mathematics. And that's that related really back to several instances where you have to figure income. So you might have many different part-time incomes 
and they're paid in different ways. And the caseworker will put all that together and calculate it mathematically so that they can determine an average weekly income, which is a little bit different. So some forms require monthly, some weekly. They had to know the difference in how to calculate it. Um, so that is applied mathematics. There were a couple cases where that's really significant. And then um, locating information was also a critical one, and that's filling out forms. It's also charts, maps, and graphs, but the majority of their work were in the forms that like you might see in NCFAST. So you have a lot of forms you're putting data in and pulling data out. What made that one a little bit difficult um, was that you have multiple forms working together, and that sometimes you use forms that might not be clear if you're trying to determine wage. You'll pull a lot of different forms together, and it could be some you haven't seen before um, in verifying income. So there are a variety of forms. And then really, I think one of the toughest was um, reading for information. And uh, the reading for information skill was relatively high because they're looking at policy. And you can't do the job without the ability to read the policy. Now, it makes the policies a little bit more difficult than just reading for enjoyment on the beach is that they have a lot of if-then statements. So when, the, when you're reading the policy, it will say, you know, do these things unless you see this. And then in that case, if you see this, go in this direction. And if you see something else, go in another direction. So in determining what direction to go into, you have to read and sort through a lot of if-thens. All right, so now what we know is that we have those pieces. We have set some assessment scores. So what we know is that if we use the ACT profile and we use those scores, that we will bring in people who have the foundational skills, that you will change the pool and you'll have people who have the foundational skills. What it also does for us from the community perspective is that if we have people who don't have the foundational skills, let's say <clears throat> normally you might have 50 people apply for a job, you're gonna hire two, and 48 just go back out into the world, you know, good luck, find something else. In this case, we will have had our hand on those 48, and we'll either be able to skill them up or help them find another position that they are qualified for. So we're filling jobs for quite a few companies. More um, of our top, or our largest, let's say, 20 employers in uh, Pitt County, more than 10 of those use this same assessment in filling their job. So we do have a lot of jobs for that, and we have a lot of our smaller ones coming on board and that are using it. So there's a strong base for people who have these, <clears throat> this certification. So let's say we take those other 48, you hire two, and the other 48, I'm either gonna skill them up or help them find another job that meets their skill. So that piece is a part of the, the foundational skills. When you know they have the ability to do it, what we find are a couple things. One, the training time is gonna be much reduced. So the time from when you bring me in to when I can hit the ground running is gonna be a lot less time. That makes me more effective, it saves you money there. It also, reduces turnover, and it reduces turnover in a couple ways. One, it reduces the turnover for poor performance, because you know I have the ability when I come in. Um, and the other thing is increase, by increasing job satisfaction, I'm a little bit more excited about it, but when I can do a job, I'm much happier at that workplace. When I have a skill deficit and I'm not, um, and, and I'm not doing really well. Someone is constantly training, retraining me. Someone's correcting my work. Someone is frustrated with my performance. I rarely say, oh my goodness, I think it's because I have a little lack of skill in locating information. I'm more likely to get frustrated at the workplace, frustrated at who's training me, frustrated with my manager, and it can set up a really bad cycle. So when we, when we know the person has the skills to be successful, then we can increase their workplace satisfaction. So we reduce turnover for poor, for poor performance, but we also reduce the kind of turnover that comes from me selecting out or opting out. So it, the companies are benefiting in many ways. So that's a real strength to it. Um, but the other piece we've looked at, now that we have that profile, is there are a lot of other sort of like what you may think of as soft skills, but they're very critical to the job. Um, and we found that the other profiler and I found in job shadowing, some of those things that are really, really important are I mean, customer service skills, the ability to work with a variety of people, and the ability to question. So how do you question in a way that's not interrogation? The people who were the best at it could do that. Because when I feel like you're asking me questions to help me, I'll give you a lot more answers and we can work a lot faster. Um, but I need to feel respected from the moment I walk in the door and I need to feel good about that interview and about that interaction. So how do you put those people at ease? How do you have that kind of questioning technique? Those things are not measured in the foundational skills. Um, so that's another piece that we were looking at 
a training and we're looking right now at something that might be around 24 hours and it would be a pre-hire training. And what that training would do is it would say, okay, you have the foundational skills. So now that you have that, you can attend this training. And what we know is that we know that you'll be able to hit the ground running. You will not struggle with policy. Maybe you've never seen it before, but you have the ability to process that level of thinking through many options. We know that you have the ability to do the math, so I don't have to worry about giving you the formula yet, but you'll be able to do the math and calculate averages and things like that. And I know that you can work with forms more than one at a time. All right, so once I know that, I'm going to put you in a 24-hour class and talk to you about what, what is NCFAST, what is the history of what you're doing. And I think it's important to be very intentional in that class about letting them see what the job is really like. Let them self-select out. It's cheaper for you if they make a decision that they won't be good at this. Um, so creating a class where they really get to see what it's about, to get their hands dirty a little bit, and to experience it, and an understanding of what they're doing, a little history to build that commitment um, of what they're doing. When we know we have that successful of a class, then hopefully um, we've got some interest from other counties. We know already Beaufort County is interested. Um, but at the community college, we work within our county, as you know. <laughs> so, but what we could do is partner with those other counties and share the ideas and the resources what we have so we're not constantly going back to zero like we did in the job profile. Um, and that makes good use of our time and money. But we could then maybe rotate that around, we're thinking, where it's offered one month here, another month in this county, and that would keep that nice pool in our region or our area of trained people who are ready to go to work. Now, I mean, I'd like to say, you know, I know that there's turnover, so I'd like to say we'd be doing it a lot, but I really believe that by using the tool, you'll reduce your turnover. I don't think it's a long-term thing. That's why it'll be nice eventually to have more than one county on board, so that if when you get to where you're hiring onesies, twosies, or you've got one person retiring, you need to replace them, there'll be some people that could attend the class in Beaufort or attend it in Lenore or one of the counties around us, Martin or somewhere. Do I have some questions? I talk fast, don't I? <laughs> yeah, I have several questions. All right, I'd love to answer them. All right, uh, first, uh, the profile from Pitt Community College, that is going to be not going to cost the county. Will it cost the county any money if you use that particular one? Not to use it. The profile is completed, and there is no cost to use it. Many Now, there's two ways to do the assessment piece. Some of our companies send people and say, you know, we don't, you have to have these scores. If you don't have these scores, you can't apply. Now, in that case, the assessment costs the people who are taking it $30. So each one is 10 and there are three of them, so it would be $30. And that's for the entire 24 hours, I believe. You, didn't you say they, they were going to have to? Okay, the 24-hour class would cost $75. All right, I thought... Now, you know, I'm very much interested in two classes. Right. One of them, you are going out and you are getting new employees. Right. That would be the, at this point, this we, we tried to find funds to make that happen to kind of get it started, and we hadn't had, we don't have success with that, not that we've given up. But that class, the new class, is 75 a person. All right. Or would be. Now, I'm very much interested in the employees that we have, especially with the crossover, getting them to be more efficient in their <laughs> okay. workload. All right. All right. We have, you know, and I told you, we have certain employees who do 20 uh, Medicaid or whatever it might be in a day, and others might do 10. But there's a reason for that, of course. That has right. to be computer skills, and these all of these things will have to be involved. Now, that's what... I would like to see, and business or that way, you are going to take and to improve and to achieve more if you're going to work for us. We have no choice but to do that. And I, you know, people sometimes have to be pushed. I'm a good example. You got to push me to do something. <laughs> but uh, that would be have to be two separate groups or classes that you would work with, would it not? Right. I believe it would be. And, and the thing on the um, incumbent worker would be to look at a couple things. One would be look to look into um, what's causing the, what is causing the issue 
for the performance. All right, what is causing the performance issues? There's two areas it's going to fall into. One, it's going to fall into foundational skills, that I don't have the skill, ability, and knowledge. Yeah. In that case, then this assessment could be helpful. I would want to make sure people were comfortable. I, I, I'm never comfortable with the take this test and, you know, bad things could happen to you. But at the community college, we already skill up for this, uh -huh. and, and people can do this at no charge. We have classes, and we have online where they can do it from home. Now, Vermont in Vermont, um, Green Mountain Coffee does it that way exclusively. So it can definitely be done that way, where we use this assessment for people who are already work and say, if we see a skill deficit, we'll give you the tools to skill up. That, that can be done. The other area, unfortunately, that job performance issues fall into would be the motivation. So, right. so the commitment or the motivation piece may not you know, be impacting this at all. Now, with the pre-hire training we're looking at, we will address that through the classroom part by being very intentional about what the job is and what's involved in the, the customer service and the interviewing and the hands-on piece. All right, but now, once they're here, that's a little more difficult. All right, this goes back to our director. Uh, this $75 that we're talking about, do we have funds in the Department of Social Services to pay this expense? I don't think we have it budgeted right now, but I think it would be a good, a good use of funds. Uh, I'm talking about from the state, not from the county. The state would participate in it if we contract. That's what it'd like to me. Yes. Well, the yeah, federal yeah, government. Yeah, we get. Probably uh, 50, I think we need to invest. It would be an admin cost. We'd probably get fifty percent of it. We back. get about fifty percent reimbursement. Well, we need to know exactly where we're going there, and, and I think you're on the right. I think we need to get surrounding counties because this will benefit them mm -hmm. as well as us. They need a pool to take in the pool from. Right. And, you know, like I said, some people have more ability. God just created us different. And some are better at computers and things that right. we're doing and others. And, and when we work together, um, like we, we work often with Beaufort Community College right now, when we have job openings that are requiring a CRC or they do, we share that information back and forth already. So we've oh. already started that pathway, um, and we could just add this piece to it. So the I, I pathway's think, there. We'd like to strengthen it. I think not only should we do that, we, we should go to the social service director in each of these counties and kind of fill them in as to what our plans are. I really do, because I'm sure Pitt County is not the only county that's having problems with it. Right. Well, we found out almost right away that Beaufort was interested. They were looking at doing the same process, and we said, let's just save some time and money and put those together, because we can do that. Um, and I was just sharing with Lenore, I think um, through ACT, what we'll be able to do is compare a task list there, and they won't have to go through the same process to have their location profiled. So I think that making that happen is going to be something we can definitely do. You know, there's Easily. one state, uh, I don't know where, up north somewhere, where they uh, are up 100%. They don't have any backlog of anything. I don't know what state that was, but it was one when we investigated. You remember, Mr. Manager? Oh, yes, sir. But we, that was one. Anyway, uh, we need to Im train these employees on this crossover. I know, Mike, you've already got a lot of them that's trained that they can do both sides, haven't you? Yes, sir. Do you we're we're working on it, yes, sir. Um, You're working on it, but you know, I was told six months ago that we were going to have this ready to go. Yes, sir. I I know um, the state's taking a step backwards, so um, and the universal worker concept has been put on hold. Uh, uh, but but it is something that eventually all counties will go to as soon as NC Fast is fully functional. There'll be no choice because <clears throat> you won't. Be, you will take one application for everything. And I, I reckon this will be my last question. Is the state now sending people out as they were at one time to assist you in training and, and maybe to work with Pitt Community College pertaining to this course that we are talking about, all courses? The, the state is very interested in it. Um, Johnston County tried something similar to this, but they didn't profile the potential uh, applicants in the training program and that is a weakness that they they have found as they've gone through more classes now it's very popular yeah. and they've had a lot of applicable 
um, applicants and participants in that program, but they did not profile people mm -hmm. to start I think with. That's the key. I, I think that's, that's, that's a, a, a very important part. They did that with the state, through the state, um, to develop a profile somewhere else, and they got the most successful. They took two of the most successful people from each pilot and two of the people who were struggling the most in each pilot and found out what the, the, the characteristics of each of them were. And I think that what Ms. Paramore has already done here is yeah. and, so and too. got the pro and, profile. And we have some too. good success um, stories already. We have a nice history with pre-hire training. And we really do um, target that particular training. So when we've profiled the job, we know whoever we put in the training already has the aptitude before we put them in the training. That's so good. that's like part one. We know they're not going to come in the class and struggle and be frustrated. The beauty of that is if you're, let's say you don't have quite the, uh, the strength you need in locating information, you, you know that for sure before you take the class. So you can skill up for free before you take the pre-hire class. So it's not, it doesn't eliminate you, it lets you enter successfully. So once you're in, then we focus on the other part and let you see the other skills and talents you need. Because some of that's really a talent to be able to work with yeah. people. You don't know who's coming in the door, you gotta work with all of them. Yeah. I guess it, uh, I see that was my last question, but I got one more. Okay. <laughs> I could talk all day about it, I, I get know very excited. You can. <laughs> I, I probably can too. But That's true. when will the courses be offered? Will some of them be offered at night so that the employees, such as what I have We seen. can definitely offer them at night and weekends, but let me tell you what we found with our other pre hire training. We will try to offer, we, off, we start out offering some nights and some weekend opportunities. Our biggest success has been running them, say, from nine to two. And the reason is that um, if you have someone who is not employed in a family situation, so you have a whole family, it allows them to get the children to school and then come to the class. So we run, we'll run something. When we get it up and running, we'll try something at night. We usually try, we have not had a single success with weekends. Um, I've always thought that people would say, oh, I'll go a couple of Saturdays and get it done. That, that has just been Mary who works on Saturdays. Uh -huh. um, so we've had no success, but I'm not done trying that. So gotcha. we'll try a Saturday. And then we'll also run one during school hours. So people who have school-aged children that might be looking to change careers will be able to do it that way. The, another key is to put it way in advance and to offer it more than one week, but don't span two weeks. So let's say I work part-time at you know, XYZ company, and if I know ahead, and ahead, I can say I need that um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday off. Can you schedule around that? And most people are able to schedule around that. We try not to span it because it's harder for them to hit more than one week off. That's the reason I'm only, you know, employees that are employed and want to advance, do it faster. That's the reason I think they should be allowed to work in the morning time, go to school in the afternoon and, and on that. Well, and we hope now, that by designing the class and, and laying it out right, we'll be able to look at people who are interested in changing careers. So recently, with the economy, we've had some dislocated workers. Some of them haven't landed in a career. They've just landed in a job. Um, I think if they knew this was out there, and then if they knew they had the skills to be successful, and we could put them through the class um, so that they get the overall piece of it, then you could have some people who are coming to a second career that could be very successful. The main thing is to work out so we're very closely aligned. What I don't want to do is put people out of a class and then have you all not not feel like they're the right fit. Now, everyone we turn out won't be right for you, um, but we have to make sure we're hand in hand that that class is doing exactly what you need it to do so that we're not promising people something we can't deliver. Remember, Mary, there are hundreds and thousands of people in Eastern North Carolina that have a college degree and are unable to get jobs and these people might be the people that you really want to reach. Absolutely, and they might be good career people. As I understand, as I understand it, you see if they have the basic skills that you were talking about, and then bring them in. That's right, and then right. they would attend the pre-hire training. So they're not on your payroll yet; they're on a pre-hire training basis. So, so what you do is you look at the the, the people skills and interacting second. Right, and I want why, why is that? Um, because when we put the money into the training class, mm -hmm. if they can't do the foundational skills that it would take to keep up, they drop out of the class. So when we lose that, what we'll do is we'll pay an instructor to train, let's say, 15 people. 
If we have only 10 that make it through, we've paid that instructor the same amount of money. So by putting the academics in ahead of time, I can do two things. I can make sure they have it before they get in so they'll be more successful. But I can also give people who don't have it an opportunity to skill up. Instead of starting the class struggling, you come into the class ready to go. It's like, I got this, I'm ready. Now, the instructor can take that class much further. So if, you, if everybody comes in with the same ability and readiness to learn and understand the information, you can go twice as far with that class. So that's the piece of that. The second piece, the interpersonal skills, will be, that's the talent. I mean, we, if they, the desire to serve like that, I mean, it's a service position, and the desire to serve will be really important. So then it's important for us to say, okay, you have the foundational skills. This is what this job is really like, and here are the techniques in customer service and interviewing that you need to acquire. So you say, you're saying it's easier to train uh, a person to interact with people than to give them the basic academic skills. Almost. No, no, but I, no, okay. sir. But I do think uh, if you're saying that it's that the other one is easier to train, I can probably teach them how to do math faster than I can teach them to like people. Mm. But, mm -hmm. but if I put them in a class and I give them some policy that I need them to read because we're going to process it, let's say they have difficulty with the policy, I may take a wonderful people person who's great with people, who's, who has the heart and the spirit and the energy that we needed, but because they're not skilled enough to read and interpret that policy, they'll drop out. They don't want to be a failure. So they dropped out of my class. I lost mm -hmm. somebody that, I, that could have been great for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it helps them to be successful in the class if they have the academic ability to do well in the class. Sort of like um, pre-screening uh, that might be more intense for you know a college class like ACT does already for attending university. I want to hear what our manager's got to say pertaining to what he has heard. Because we have to depend on him a great deal as to what. What do you think about it, Scott? Well, I think it's a great program. Um, as Ms. Paramore said, it is going to allow the agency to target and to screen out appropriate candidates for the, for the position. So I think um, I think the funding is still uh, maybe on the $75 to take the class maybe is unresolved. But um, um, I think we're pretty far down this road that we're pretty committed to to doing this as you know we've been measuring um, production both in applications and reviews um, and we found a big disparity between the highest produ producers and the lowest producers um, we measured we initially determined that we needed 47 more positions obviously I don't think we're gonna get 47 more positions this year so we have to increase capacity and part of that is to get the right people and to train train them. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen, there's one person over there that's been there a year that's the, the highest producer in the agency. Isn't that right, Brian? In, in and, that program area. In, in that program area. <clears throat> and so that is one way we can increase we can increase the capacity of the positions that we do have to to get more work done. Another way is to retrain the people who were struggling and see if that increases That's their capacity and then then that gives us you know some questions that need to be answered but it is it's a people service position but it's also a production position right and we have to get the productivity done we have timelines to take and process applications in various programs and, and it has to be done and we are not capable of doing that at this particular time and I think when the funding is, um, when we were talking about the funding, we've also been partnering all along with um, Neil Anderson from the NC Works Workforce Solutions, formerly the Employment Security Commission. <laughs> and in talking with Neil, we've looked at, you know, could we use WIA funds to pay for people to take the pre-hire training? If we do that, then you lose the opportunity to do the OJT, which is the OJT pays you back for part of their salary while they're learning the job, that initial piece. So there are a couple other pieces of funding from other programs. Mary, just you the may best. Want to explain the acronyms of the OJT and the WIA. Okay. <laughs> so the Workforce Investment Act, I mean, that's Neil's program, but basically it gives some funds for quick hire training where people can take the training and then they can return return to work or enter a new career field. Um, if you use those funds, it could cover the class cost, 
but then you would lose the opportunity for on-the-job training program. And the on-the-job training program is a program that they have where if you, let's say we have a person who's worked at XYZ company and they were displaced during the downturn in the economy and they're underemployed right now. They're doing some work, but they, they kind of, the job they had is gone or maybe they can't go back to it. If we retrain them, we put them through the um, work keys assessment and a pre-hire, we, we feel pretty good about their success in the job and we put them, and you hire them, we put them in the job, then the OJT or on the job program will pay a certain percentage of their salary. They have a formula they calculate with that. It will pay a certain percent until they are up to 75, but it kind of depends on what their experience and background is. But it will pay a certain portion of that up to when they're considered skilled. Um, so you get back eligible, eligible for that. Right. They need to be eligible, which means unemployed or underemployed. If they had this, let's say they have this exact same job in Beaufort County and they come here, clearly they're not going to be eligible because there isn't really on the job training that's happening more than just getting acclimated to the differences in your office. But if we have somebody who maybe had a customer service job at Walmart, let's say they're working part time in customer service at Walmart and they have the skill and ability and then they take the training and there's someone you would want to invest in and you say, okay, we'll, we'll do this six months training in our portion. Then you would get, that would be a more significant reimbursement for those six months while they're being trained. One, um, just to kind of go back over a concern and I, I think you're addressing it, but I want to bring that up again okay. is that oftentimes that, um, formalized testing is not the best predictor of success and has been shown to not be the best predictor in 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 college oftentimes uh, social intelligence is, is a lot uh, better predictor and I didn't want us to get stuck in with giving uh, people a, a basic entry-level test and said they have the skills and we can teach them the other things so right. that that's that, that's agree. my concern I agree let me I'm I'll hand this, this might help. This gives you an idea what the skills are. Um, and what I, there's a hundred and something page report that goes with every profile, which I knew nobody wanted. So I just have three pages and I circled the skill level that we profiled. But the thing it will do, one thing it will do is it, um, it is not an assessment for, let's Thank take you. example, the reading. It is not a wild reading assessment. What it is, is it's actual HR memos, safety memos, policies and procedures from real companies. And ACT takes each one of those assessments. Then they send those assessments to the different groups for validation and reliability studies. So we know that it's pretty reliable. Um, and then we profile the job to say, do we have memos and things like this. So it's real memo. Here's your HR memo. What, what, you know, now where do you report? What do you do if, on a snow day? It's real questions. So it isn't, and it throws people off sometimes because when they come, they think they can take a test. Well, just tell me what I have to know. And it really isn't that kind of an assessment. It really is workplace memos, workplace graphs, blueprints. Can you follow it? And, you know, if you receive this on the job, would you know what to do? Um, so it is very much focused on that. So it has a higher reliability and validity than it's based on the job than let's say um, your SAT score to determine if you'll be successful. So you put your SAT score with your GPA and try to make a decision about that. And sometimes your GPA shows you work twice as hard as anybody else. Um, so you can balance that out with the date, the Saturday you took the test, that part is true. So, it, so what you're saying is the, the reliability is good. In other words, you'll get the same kinds of things if you test again. Yes. But also you're saying that the validity is good because it tests what the job is and not something else. Right. It's not random. They're all workplace memos and workplace safety type things. And you know that as one goes up, the other always goes down. So what you're saying is you got a pretty good mix there. I think they do. That's it's you know it's well they do statistically. Yeah, ACT is all industrial organizational psychologists, and so while they're um, sometimes considered different. <laughs> well, I'm a psychologist, so, so you be okay, nice so to you us. know them, right? Well, they're so a they're, different group. They're a different group, aren't they? <laughs> mm -hmm. But they um, but it's all they do, and so I I have been satisfied with my interactions with them as well as it's already used across the country. Now, one nice thing about it is it is portable. So because most states use it, once you have this credential, it can be used in other places. So once you take those assessments, it's not just to get this job or just to get into our college. It has wide use. So I, 
I feel good about that because I know that if somebody comes in and takes this assessment and we work with them and it's not a good fit for your job, I believe I can find a job for them. I mean, right now we're trying to fill over 60 jobs for people who have assessments. So we have jobs. Um, getting people in the right fit is the key. And for me, I, I mean, I'm, I do a lot of my training in the um, customer service, leadership, and team development type skills. So that's a real challenge. I mean, I've been there when people say, here's this really ornery, hard to get along with person. Can you make them wonderful and delightful? And that, that I'd rather teach them math. Mm -hmm. I give you that. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Next, we're going to the um, technology update. Um, we are currently working on several projects at, at DSS. There are um, several more projects that um, we are addressing at this time, but what we did was try to narrow down for you what were the most important ones, the pri priority ones that we've identified at this time. We are uh, working on a kiosk implementation. We have six computers that are in, the, in an area over at the Human Service Center, and we are working toward using those computers so that customers can come in and they can complete an application for food and nutrition uh, through our ePass. Um, the same um, application that the state uses in order for a person to complete an application online. So we've worked with N the NC FAST team. Um, they have sent folks out for us to, to, and have come over to the Human Service Center and looked at the computers and what we're trying to do with ePass, and we're currently in the process of testing the ePass op application in order for customers to uh, complete the food and nutrition application. That's what we're going to start with. Um, so that's where we are with that at this point. Um, the next project that we have is our um, scanning process, and there are two phases to this scanning process. First, we're trying to uh, look at scanning in our incoming mail and so that um, it's scanned into the system and it can be emailed directly to the worker that needs that mail. And we're also looking at a process of scanning in the mail and attaching the mail to the NC FAST document so that if, a, if there is a, um, an application for food and nutrition and we're waiting on wages to come in for that particular application that when the customer brings the wages into DSS, we can scan it in and attach it to the NC FAST case. So when the worker pulls up that case, that document is already attached to the case. So those are the two phases that we're looking at as far as scanning in incoming documents to the agency. Can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. How much time do you think that will save? It, it's, hard, it's hard to determine. Well, it, the, yeah, that's I, what I'm I think, thinking. I think if you look at that, how many times that paper's moved through an agency and is touched, mm -hmm. if we can do a food and nutrition review, which I understand there are a thousand that comes in every month, if they can do that, um, they can attach it to the NC FAST case that we already have in NC FAST. Uh, they, there are a couple of other procedures they need to do. One person can do that. That will not have to go back to the review workers. And that will take care of the food and nutrition review. It's another way we're trying to increase capacity. As Ms. Burns said, if changes comes in, address change, changes in the number of the members in the household, uh, changes in the income, if we scan that in and send it to the worker that's doing that review case, then that's some more paper that we won't be having to handle and look for and chase all around the agency. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be real important to being able to increase our capacity as well. Um, we probably get two pallets of paper 
a month, don't we? Ms. Quinn, and you think how many times those pieces of paper get touched and get moved, moved around. If we can take the mail, if we can scan, at least to start with the food and nutrition reviews and the changes, and, and train some people to be able to accomplish that function without the other workers having to handle it, then I think we, that'll that'd be another very important measure to increase the capacity of our workers to get their jobs done. Um, the other part of the scanning that we're looking at is with our uh, legal department, where we're looking at scanning the court reports and the court orders. And once they are scanned, then we can email them directly to the attorneys that need them uh, or directly to the social worker that needs a certain court report or whatever. And um, this will save a lot, again, on our paper, because we, when we do court reports now, we have to make at least, I believe, eight copies to go to the different attorneys that need it, the parents, um, the social workers. And with this method, we can uh, quickly, the attorneys will be able to get their re court reports quicker um, and we can get the information directly where it needs to go quicker. The, the, um, oftentimes the paralegals have taken mm -hmm. a wagon because these reports are not two and three pages thick. Sometimes, what, they're an inch, an inch mm -hmm. thick, or is that right, Ms. Dixon? Inch mm -hmm. and a half or more. Mm -hmm. And they've literally taken a wagon over to mm -hmm. deliver those to people because they're, so um, not only are we saving paper, but we're saving the paralegals time and all the time it takes to be able to distribute those too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much money do you think this will cost to get the scanners and things of that nature? Uh, the county already has that equipment and we have scanners uh, with our copiers that mm -hmm. we can turn on at no additional cost. So. Really? So, would, so really we could do this with no more um, expense? There, there, mm -hmm. there could be It'd some. It could be minimal. There could be some additional scanners, but um, the multiple copies scanning. Um, Can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, but it would be good to, to once we started, to yeah. track it so that we know what our cost savings has been over time. Yeah, because it seems like it would be um, tremendous because right now I, I'm, my assumption is there's a mm -hmm. lot of hands touching various mm -hmm. types of mail. It's, it's taking a while to get something is here. Wow. It may get lost in things of of that nature, as well as the fact it's accessible to a larger number of uh, people. And you're also going to save a little bit of money on paper. We won't need as many pallets, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, the next project is are the DSS smartphones, child welfare services, as well as some of the adult services social workers now have access to smartphones. And what we are wanting to do with the use of smartphones, um, and each social worker now has been assigned a s smartphone of their own, whereas in the past, we had phones that could be checked out if the worker needed them, and not all workers were assigned phones. At this point, all social workers have been assigned a smartphone. And through the smartphone, they will have access to their supervisor while they're out in the field. If they need to speak with their supervisor, they, they can easily access them now. They can email them. They can text them. They can do whatever they need to do to communicate about what's going on out in the field. And also, while they're out in the field, we want them to have access to DMV, OLV, the central registry where they can go into the system, the state system, and look up whatever information they need to access concerning any family that they're working with while they're out in the field. So they will be able to um, link into um, the um, different applications that they link into in the office so instead of having to come back into the office to look up information, they can do that while they're out in the field. 
They will also have the ability to take pictures using their smartphones, do videos using their smartphones. So we see that also as a way of increasing their capability to do their job. So at this point, I believe um, Mr. Patel told me that they have um, assigned smartphones to um, all of the social workers. There are about 15 more that need to be assigned to smartphones, but most of them now have their smartphones and they are learning to use them. They will also go through a training session with the phone company in the use of their smartphones how to use them um, best and because um, um, like um, Mr. James says, not everybody is capable of using new technology. So we are aware of that. So we're going to um, have everybody trained by the phone company in how to use their phone. Um, also, we're looking at um, our outpost workers. We have workers that are over at Viden Hospital, over at the Bernstein Center, that do not have um, access to Pitt County applications. Um, they are unable to do their timesheets unless they come into this building and use a computer to do their timesheet. So um, we're also looking at working on um, their ability to have um, to access Pitt County applications at their remote site so they don't have to come in here to do their timesheet. They don't have to come in here to uh, find someone's phone number or whatever. And they will also be able to access the state applications um, just as the workers here in the building are able to do their job. So we're working on that also. And these are the projects that we have identified that we want to get as much done on these projects prior to um, the end of June. And we are doing schedules on all projects to make sure that they're sustainable. It was sort of, I think we did a lot of talking about things a lot of times and came up with wish lists, but we never followed through on it. So um, Mr. Patel has helped us come up develop timelines on it and schedules and who's responsible for what and hopefully to be able to follow through on all those and, and finish on all those. Because I think as you can see, they're all very, very important. We can all be much more productive. We can communicate a lot better. Um, in the case of the smartphones, I think it would give the capacity to do second party reviews Mm -hmm. um, on child welfare cases out in the field, if you can if you can email a picture or a video back to the supervisor, I think they can get a pretty good feel for what's going on as well, and 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 that would certainly protect children better. You can make better decisions when you have that second party review and you have that supervisor's review, and um, and you can protect children better with that. Does that also include FaceTime on the phones? There, the Mr. Patel, that there's a video conferencing application being looked at. Okay. Hello. Uh, as far as the video conferencing goes, um, the phones that were assigned to the workers are Samsung Android phones. And so FaceTime is specific to Apple uh, products. We're looking at a, a similar product, uh, a similar application called Tango. And we're testing that mm. with the with the phones right now. We have successfully tested that. And so once all the staff members have the phones, we will go ahead and, and launch the application and then provide the training for them to do the video conferencing and have the hands-on training at that time so that they're able to do that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions there? Okay. All right. Um, next, we're going to move to the um, director's report. Okay, I found the agenda here. I think I'm first. Huh? Um, the first thing is the 214 and 15 budget update. And um, I've asked Ms. Quinn to give you, uh, do the same report that she's done for the county commissioners and the county manager for you here. And she's got it up here on the 
overhead. Before we go through the, the, the budget that's on the overhead, in your packet you'll see a um, spreadsheet that's really un 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 untitled, but it's called Mandated Services. Page 13. Page 13, yes. Um, this was a report that we had to give to the commissioners to kind of explain where uh, county funding goes and what services are mandated. And laying on your sh your uh, on the podium, there's five sheets of paper that look like this. Um, this these are the mandated programs that the state says the Department of Social Services has to provide each year. And I kind of wanted to correlate them just a little bit. Uh, if you look on uh, under on, on this sheet, there's a cross reference to the mandated program, so you can look. And the very first one on here is home and community-based services. And if you look on your sheet one through five, if you look on page one, you'll see the number one, home community-based uh, services. So this is the cost that it costs the county and the breakout of how the money comes for the mandated programs that the Department of Social Services is mandated to provide. In uh, the fiscal year 13-14, the only two programs that the Department of Social Services provided to the citizens of Pitt County that were not mandated by the state was the Community Alternative Program, which is uh, CAP, it's, it's known as CAP, it's in-home services for, for folks, and the Smart Start Program, which is, is a, a child daycare. But everything else that the Department of Social Services provides is a mandated services. And I think the big thing that this, uh, e this spreadsheet will show you, if you look on the on, I think yours is maybe on the back. It brings it down to the county dollar of eight million seven eight nine nine sixty nine. Is that there are the, the state has no money basically in 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 what goes on in this county. We got a thirty five million thirty six million dollar program that's run in the Department of Social Services, and the state gives us three million eight. When you when you look at it, that's not a lot in there, but yet they mandate the services that we have to do. And this just brings you down. And, and last year, 13-14, the, the county gave us 8 million seven eight nine nine sixty nine, and that's how it's broke down so that you can see it. I just thought you might be interested in seeing what the commissioners saw at, at their board and how our, our funding is mandated funding for programs are broke, broken down. Do you have any questions about this? There was one question at the county um, commissioners meeting some of these funds are capped. Yes, they are. Yeah, I need. Yeah, that that is the case. Like uh, the social services block grant, and over a period of time, the county's participation has increased, while that federal dollar has not increased. But it is a mandated service, and you have to continue to provide it. So, county funding in in programs funded by SSBG, by the TANF program, it's it's capped as well now as the very nature of a block grant. And over time, expenditures increase, and the county is ends up being required to pick up the other part of it. You, you can actually see that if you look at the child, down number 17, cross-reference cross number 17, Child Protective Services. Most of the pots of money that, that we have to provide Child Protective Services are capped. And you can see that the feds give us Eight hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. The state gives us one hundred thirty-two, but the county has to put up about two million dollars to provide the services that are mandated by the by the uh, state to provide, and, and that's the way it is because SSBG used to fund everything in, in sight, and over the years they've cut it and they've reduced it, and and now it's not. It, but it is the funding source mostly for for all the funding source for adult services basically. So. So you can see that there's a, there's a lot of county dollars goes into the programs. That the we administration provide. program for the yeah. public assistance programs has always been 50% federal and 50% county. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, the federal government has allowed some 75% funding for Medicaid um, activities that are done in the NC FAST program, and that will expand over a period of time, too. Um, but that's an entitlement program, and people are entitled to those those services if if they qualify for them. And so that money has always been the state has never 
participated to any extent in the administration of those programs has always been a, a county, federal government type of program. In the services areas, unfortunately, they've gone to cap, to cap um, funding, and as time goes on, more and more of that cost has been borne by the county. We're currently right now uh, worried about what they might do some of those funding pots at the, at the uh, state level because of what the feds are doing during the short session that they're up there. We had to answer some, uh, answer some questions to try to make sure that they didn't take money from the pots that they're going to be sending down to the county to fund some of the issues that they have up at the state level. For instance, the $340 million shortfall, I think it is, in Medicaid, those kinds of things. But uh, hopefully we're going to be able to keep our funding that's in the budget that the short session won't do something too far out to us. So if you don't have any other questions about that, if you do, just let me know. We'll run quickly through the, the next year's budget. This was also presented to the commissioners, I think, last week. This, for this for the year 1415 I don't know if that strikes any of you funny but that seems like a futuristic number to me 2014 2015 but anyway there we go we're asking our total line item budget that runs through the county is about 31 million 588 for next fiscal year pretty much on part of where it, where it is this year um, I don't know how to do this so maybe it won't go. Susan, you know how to do this? <laughs> it didn't move when I tried to do it. Go to the next one. Okay. This is a six year comparison of the county funding. And as you can see, we had gotten up in 10 and 11, we went up, and then 12 and 13, we went down. And now we've started back 13 and uh, 13, 14. And we're asking for 14 and 15. But that, that, that going up number looks like it's climbing, but it's only a couple hundred thousand dollars so, in county dollars, so really it's not a huge number uh, that we're looking at. You've heard a lot of talk recently about the services that we have to provide. I wanted to show you, sorry about that. <laughs> the next slide is um, a shows you the Medicaid recipients and the food and nutrition recipients from 2007 to 2004. And if you look and see, Medicaid's gone up from 22,293 in 2007 to 31,000 families, I believe, or pe people. And food and nutrition has gone from 19,361 to 31,469. So the caseload has grown exponentially over the last few years, but our staff has not grown at all. And um, so I, we looked at some productivity. You heard Mr. Merritt talk about productivity for a while. And for the month of April, this is on the productive, produ productive uh, slide. For the month of April, they had 6,982 cases and 68 staff to, to do that work. That meant that each one of those staff had to do 102 cases to be able to process all of the work that they had in the month of April. What they were actually able to do was they processed uh, uh, 4,579 cases by those 67 staff, which gave an average of 67 cases being processed per staff. So there was a difference of um, the number of cases that needed to be processed and the actual that they were able to process. So it, to come up with another number of how many more staff we thought they would need, we divided the, the actual 67 cases that they were able to do. That there again, I, like I said, it's an average for the month into the remaining cases that had to be done, which was 2,403 cases. That meant we needed another 36 additional staff in order to get all those cases processed in a month's time. 6,982 cases. That's just a mathematical doing it. And of course, it, you know, the, the number of cases vary some, but not a lot from month to month. So we definitely don't have enough staff. We looked at child welfare in the same way from 2009 through 2013 of reports accepted. And we had 840 cases 
that was accepted in uh, 2009 and up to 1,016 cases now. And all through those years, we've had 12 staff. Staff hasn't grown at all, but again, the caseload has grown throughout all of it. And, um, and that's just the cases that were accepted, accepted and that's yeah. just a fraction of the reports right. that were made. So what we have done with that has, our- Something has to be done with. Yeah. Have, they have to be screened, at, screened right, Ms. Dixon? Mm -hmm. And, and it, that takes quite a bit of time, too. Yeah. So what we've done with our budget, and I don't have a chart to show you this, but what we have done is we try to live within the, ram the uh, parameters that the county had provided for us. And um, we are looking at, we've, cut, we, we've reduced costs everywhere that we possibly could reduce costs to try to come up with having enough, getting some new staff. So our budget right today as it stands has 28 new income maintenance staff in it and three new uh, IA and T investigative child welfare positions in it. We were able to maintain those in the in the budget uh, within the funding increase that the county manager felt that he could support for us by several different things. Like I said, we cut everything that we possibly could to the as, as close as we could. That was not a mandated thing that we had to do. In addition to that, the 75% reimbursement money that we're expecting to get from Medicaid allowed us to um, be able to have more positions because the revenue is going to go up to which will pay for that. Instead of it costing the county 50% for those positions, it'll now cost 25% as long as they're working in NC FAST. Now, Medicaid is not completely 100% into NC FAST at this particular time, but I think probably by December they will probably uh, start implementing it where everything will be done in NC FAST. So we think that this was a very reasonable reasonable way to, to present our budget and try to get the staff that we need in order to, to process the cases. If we don't get the staff, these are some di there's some pretty dire consequences that's going to happen. And one of them is that citizens of Pitt County that cannot receive their Medicaid benefits, they're going to end up dying. I know you guys have just heard recently on the news where uh, they think 40 veterans died in New Mexico or somewhere because they couldn't get an appointment in the VA because of whatever's going on. The same thing's going to happen in our Medicaid arena if we don't have enough staff to provide the people with the, with the benefit that they're entitled to have. The children of Pitt County, uh, again, will not be safe because we don't have enough people to uh, look after them, and we could very well lose a child without having um, the right enough people to do that. And I guess the ramification of food and nutrition benefits is not as dire simply because there are food banks and those kinds of things within the community, but people are going to be hungry because there's not enough food out there to keep people going if we cannot provide the, ish the benefits that they've had. And as I showed you back on one of the earlier slides, we're currently looking at like 31,000 people for Medicaid and 31,000 people for food stamps. That's a large number of people that, that we're being affected. And so that's why we're requesting the 28 new uh, positions in our budget at this time. Mr. Chairman, if I can just speak. Um, these positions are recommended in the budget and we feel confident by providing 31 additional positions to one single department that these statements that are under the consequences will will not be realized. Right. I just want to make that public statement sure. that the resources will be um, dedicated to meet the needs. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that was um, certainly um, a concern um, because I knew there were some issues with um, being understaffed and some other things that were um, causing some problems as well. So concerned, I was very concerned about that. I think one thing that was very um, good is that the staff worked on creative ways of how to fund it so that it, all the money that we had to pay for these positions did not fall directly on the county. Right. We, we, and, and the state helped, well, that actually the federal government helped by coming up with the 75% funding to be able to help us do that. Okay. All right. We have any other questions?
NC Fast. Right, NC Fast. Um, Mr. Avery, you got any comments on that? Yes. Um, the, you have uh, in front of you the productivity report. We've been tracking this since the middle of February, and uh, it shows you about midway the page the um, total number of reviews and applications, the workload to be processed during that approximately three months period of time is 19,214. That's reviews and applications. During that period of time, the staff have processed 12,062 uh, reviews and applications. So it leaves for that period of time a total of 7,152 applications and reviews that are left to be processed. Of course, we talked to the last meeting about the fact that we do have our food and nutrition services program in compliance, and there's a report uh, on your desk that shows where we've come from. The January 27th report um, shows that uh, at that time, of course, the backlog was in food and nutrition services was 1,231 applications. And uh, we've been in compliance with the program uh, since the USDA deadlines in February and March. But there is uh, one report, the later report, May 7th, 2014, it shows Pitt County with zero uh, applications untimely, uh, and the regular applications, zero applications untimely with expedited processing. So we have been able to get to a point where we are maintaining the Food and Nutrition Services applications with the staff, uh, the current staff that we have, but as a result, we cannot maintain the Medicaid applications and reviews that we have. We do have a plan in place uh, for the, our existing staff to work uh, on the past due applications and reviews in Medicaid, and we have um, been given a directive by the state Statewide, all counties have been given a directive that applications have to take precedence over in Medicaid over the reviews. The state is extending the family and children's Medicaid reviews, but we're still required to complete the adult Medicaid reviews. And uh, as a result, we have um, our existing uh, applications, intake application staff working on the backlog of Medicaid applications. Certain days are designated for that, but because of the number of applications currently they're getting, they cannot carry all of the loads. So we have identified uh, review workers in the review section also work on applications, and they're being assigned applications to assist with those applications as well. So we do have a plan and are making an effort with the existing staff to do what we have capacity to do with the backlog of uh, Medicaid applications, but what's going to help us is when we can bring on additional staff and have a, a more sufficient staff to handle the numbers that we're receiving. Um, do you have a number of how many applications at this time? We have approximately uh, that number that shows 7,152. We have approximately uh, applications 3,650. Of that, approximately 250 of food and nutrition services, so we're looking at about 3,400 mm -hmm. in Medicaid. And then uh, the reviews out of that figure, 3,502. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can, can I ask, is how, Earl, how daunting is that number? Um, it, 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 it is very daunting. <laughs> um, we, it would, as we asked the commissioners earlier, we wanted to go ahead and hire 12 if they were going to carry them over and use uh, lap salary money to do that with. And the sooner, the sooner we can do that, the sooner we can start training people and get them to function and so we can get that job done. We have used Vanguard, as we showed, to do some reviews, but not applications. So um, it's it requires a lot of face to face, a lot of face to face contact, which reviews don't don't do, and uh, it, it's um, it's quite frightening to me. So reviews are normally done every six months, correct? <coughs> yes, so uh, some mo are, most of them are right. six months. 
Uh, food and nutrition services reviews are six months. Uh, a lot of the Medicaid reviews are 12 months, but there are some Medicaid categories that have six month reviews. <clears throat> so are the reviews being put on the back shelf by the state for both food, nutrition, and Medicaid, or just? Not food and nutrition services, just, just Medicaid. Medicaid. Okay, will that allow you to work down the back load within Medicaid more speedily? That, that, that is, was the position that the state took in family and children's only, though, not in adult Medicaid and long-term care, which are very time-consuming as well. What, what kinds of things can um, be done to speed up that process to get that backlog down? Well, some of the things we were talking about today with the mail and things like that mm -hmm. would allow us to, and shifting personnel, and we, um, Mr. Abert and his staff have worked on a plan to prioritize applications and re and re um, allocate review staff to um, application staff, and that is one thing that we can do. Um, conceivably, I guess we could work more hours too, and and um, to do that, although that gets self defeating after a while, because after you work so many hours and so many overtime hours, the productivity seems to lag a little bit. Um, but th those are the those are the things that I see now. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do is take people whose productivity levels are very low and retrain them and let them learn again by repetition, hopefully to speed them up so we'll get more capacity that way too. That's another thing that we've tried to do. But, <laughs> but ultimately there's just not enough staff to do them all right now, not enough trained staff to do them all. And you're thinking that with the, the request of the new, uh, the 31, that we'll be able to be a little more current and do this in more time. I think fashion. once we get, <clears throat> if we get 28 more staff, if we use the process through Pitt Community College to identify people who are more likely to be productive, and as I said, there's, there's somebody over that, um, there's one worker now who does reviews, I think, but she does more than anybody there, and she's only been there for a year, and it's because she has those qualities that we're looking for in, in new employees and why it's so important that, that we do that. I think it, it's a, a multifaceted problem, and I think it'll take a multifaceted approach to do it. But with those numbers of people, the sooner we can get them to train, the sooner we can get them um, to, to working and to be productive the best is the best chance we'll have to come close to catching up. I know this may be unfair. Is there an idea of when you think we <clears throat> we might be back to zero? <laughs> I see there's a lot of laughing, so I don't think that's I said it was zero. unfair. This 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 problem or is it this problem this problem is not unique to mm -hmm. Pitt County. But I'm hopeful that Pitt County is going to address it, and we're going to start and, and, and start in the right direction. That mm -hmm. that is what we really what we really need to do. As I said, we got a we've got a, a plan. It's a multifaceted plan um, using technology, using um, the community college to help us with it, and and um, and to move in that direction. Yeah. From my standpoint, the plan seems very aggressive and it is multifaceted. So I'm, you know, I'm encouraged by that because I don't think it's just one thing. Anybody else have any? No, I have to leave it to you. Oh. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we go go on next to uh, status of status of, status of agency personnel? We have. Um, 14 vacant positions right now, and um, one is frozen because the person has not vacated that position. So really it's not a vacancy yet until the person leaves. So That's right. Probably shouldn't be on the list. So we could say it, it's zero, but um, we, have, we haven't started advertising for that. Something real interesting that I want you to see, as you know, we started to hunt our hunt group to answer the telephone. And as you can see, the number of calls have gone down drastically because people are ha not having to call over and over and 
over again. Not nearly as many calls are going through the switchboard, and I, I think that's worked real well. It's created some problems for some of the staff that end up getting telephone calls sometimes, but I think the more we use it, the more productive it will be, and I think most people are getting a telephone call now. I think another reason they've gone down is um, because we've been so much more timely on our food and nutrition program. We're not getting nearly as many calls from there. And when we do get them, um, we just refer them to a couple of individuals over um, at the Human Resource Center, and they get those things resolved very quickly. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Very good. Okay. Are we going to the uh, telephone? Oh, that is That's what I just did. Ah, okay. I was wondering about that. Okay. Um, we don't have anything to add with the closed session. Why don't you? Yeah. Do you need a closed session? I, I think for. You need a motion. I move we go to the second session. Okay. 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 Why don't we just do it? What was that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to get a motion. Go into closed yeah. session. Mr. James May. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11 regarding closed sessions. Section A, permitted purposes. It is the policy of this state that closed sessions shall be held only when required to permit a public body to act in the public interest as permitted in this section. A public body may hold a closed session and exclude the public only when a closed session is required. Also, item number one, to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of this state or of the United States or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statute. Okay. Okay, just return from closed session. I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. Second. I second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. We are formally in. Okay. Um, I'll, be, I'll be doing nothing. Let's see. We're still on. Thank you. Thank you.